everyone. So my name is Nehesha, like she said, and I am a registered dietitian at the Comprehensive Cancer Center at Stanford Healthcare. Thank you all for coming in today and bearing the bad weather, and I hope all of you had a lovely Thanksgiving. So before we get started, I'm gonna throw some questions out there. Um, whether you or you may have seen your loved ones um, with cancer, how many of you, you know, seen, say, a significant amount of weight loss amongst them? Yes, okay. How many of you have seen a huge loss of appetite, eating way less than usual? Okay. How many of you have seen, say, a visible loss of muscle, like the legs and arms look skinnier than usual? Okay, so all the raise of hands, it highlights certain symptoms associated with malnutrition, and you know certainly malnutrition commonly arises in cancer patients. The research has shown that uh, malnutrition can Im impact up to 85% of patients with cancer. Uh, the literature also shows that well-nourished individuals who, um, who are, you know, able to um, sustain their weight, able to eat more, overall is well-nourished, can certainly, um, you know, tolerate treatment better. There's less interruptions with uh, their cancer treatment. There's a reduced risk of complications. And to some extent, can also reduce the need of hospital admissions. So it's so important that we treat malnutrition the beginning, during, and after um, cancer treatment as part of the ongoing care for cancer. So today, we're going to talk about ways on how we can address malnutrition during and beyond cancer treatment. So I'm going to jump right in. So we have no speaker disclosures to discuss today. Our learning objectives for today is one, is to recognize signs and symptoms of malnutrition. Uh, two is to understand the physiology and impact of starvation versus inflammation on nutrition health. Both can certainly contribute to the development of malnutrition. Uh, three is to learn the consequences of malnutrition globally in cancer care. And fourth is to implement interventions to treat malnutrition so we can certainly continue to promote positive outcomes. So now there are several definitions of malnutrition out there, and it, sometimes it can make it challenging to identify malnutrition when we're using different definitions amongst organizations and healthcare providers. Uh, so to give you an example, the World Health Organization, it refers malnutrition to a state of deficiency uh, or a state of excess when it comes to nutrient intake. And overall refers to an imbalance in a person's intake of energy, referring to calories and overall nutrients. Malnutrition can cover um, both spectrums, what we call undernutrition and overnutrition. So undernutrition can refer to um, stunting of growth. And often these terms are used in the pediatric population, but can certainly translate in, over into the adult patient population as well, um, considering we may see signs of uh, wasting where the body weight could be much lower um, than the height of that individual, or someone is underweight when we may compare that weight to a BMI range. And overnutrition may relate, you know, refer to certainly as overweight, um, obesity, and certainly any other diet-related um, diseases that may impact diet and um, nutrition. Where UNICEF, um, their own definition is that overall, the diet does not provide enough calories and protein to meet the needs for growth, development, maintenance, or that particular individual is not able to use the food in a way to nourish themselves due to a chronic illness. And they also refer to malnutrition as overnutrition, where one may consume too many calories. And the different research and literature articles out there is, you know, change in body composition, as we, as we may refer to anthropometrics, a weight loss that has not happened on purpose, um, certainly not taking in enough calories. Uh, some literature may refer to labs to indicate malnutrition, especially with low albumin levels, and certainly a compromised immune function. And then Academy of Nutrition and Dietetic, which is our professional organization for dietitians, um, they have defined a malnutrition as a physical state of unbalanced nutrition. And again, it can refer to undernutrition or overnutrition. So again, it goes back to the same concept, okay, what do we use to help identify and diagnose and treat malnutrition? 
So at this point, there's really no standardized definition of malnutrition. But as dietitians, we know what we look for when we want to screen for malnutrition and go from there to help our um, physician teams to diagnose malnutrition. So what are the characteristics of malnutrition? Um, so we use the consensus recommendations from the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics along with the American Society of Parental and Enteral Nutrition. So they have outlined several characteristics that may compass um, malnutrition syndrome, where one is weight loss. This weight loss has happened not on purpose. Um, we are not clear why this weight loss has happened, but there is a weight loss. Two is, is that there's not enough calories in coming in from the diet, and in turn, that has you know, uh, led to the weight loss as well. Loss of subcutaneous fat. Um, subcutaneous fat is our deepest layer of fat, and any type of weight loss can um, go deeper um, beyond um, with impacting our fat stores as well as our muscle stores. And over time, patients can certainly experience a loss of both. And it can certainly occur in stages where in the beginning it may not be as visible. And then as one continues to lose weight and lose fat and muscle stores, um, the signs and symptoms are apparently um, quite can become quite visible. Fluid accumulation, where um, fluid can certainly build up in the hands and the feet and the legs, and that could be a possible sign of malnutrition as an imbalance has occurred within the nutrients in the body. And the last thing is an abnormal hand grip strength, which is a, it's an assessment of muscle function. And um, with using the hand grip strength, that is a, a newer tool that's being used out there. Several of our teams, um, our colleagues, uh, are using this assessment um, within their teams, and we're hopeful we can bring it into the cancer center one of these days. So our screening criteria is that, you know, if one of our patients start to exhibit two or more any of these symptoms, then they need to be further evaluated on the extent and how severe these symptoms are to help um, carry that diagnosis of malnutrition. So why does cancer increase the risk of malnutrition? You know, cancer itself, it does place a higher demand on metabolism, okay? So calorie needs, protein needs, fluid needs are going to be always much higher um, during the course of cancer than an individual that does not have cancer, okay? So using this as an example for a 56-year-old male who's 5'10", 170 pounds with a BMI of 24, his, his needs without any diagnosis of cancer could be at 1,900 calories, 62 grams of protein, and 1,900 ml of fluids. But with the cancer diagnosis, um, to help compensate for the increase in demand on our metabolism on the body, um, this same individual may need 2,500 calories or more to help compensate, along with 115 grams of protein, as well as 2,700 ml of fluids. So overall, there's an increased need of calories, proteins, and fluids across the margin. However, for those who are experiencing um, side effects from cancer, they're not feeling well enough to eat, um, or maybe they don't have the help that they need to help put their meals together because they're so tired from their cancer treatment can all play a role in getting in the way of meeting these needs. So where is all the calories and protein um, needs? You know, Why is it increased in cancer? So cancer is a state of inflammation. Okay, so any state of inf significant inflammation is going to put that demand on our metabolism. Uh, we need the extra calories and protein uh, to repair any damage to healthy cells and tissues. And you know, once the cancer treatment is over, we want our body to regenerate and, and build healthy cells again. So we need to provide our body fuel for that. And then last is that to really help you know, correct changes in body composition to stabilize weight, stop losing weight, and to restore muscle uh, in order to be able to move forward. So these are some of the reasons why we need more calories and protein um, to help meet these needs. So what are the causes of malnutrition and cancer? There are several players here. So for one, um, you know, certainly symptoms, side effects of cancer treatment, this could be taste changes, uh, where foods do not taste as they should. You know, 
we naturally want to eat foods that we like, and we may not eat foods we don't like. So it, not, it may create an aversion to certain foods that we used to love. Restrictive diets, where some diets tend to pull out multiple food groups. I'm so sorry. Um, uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, based on, you know, what your physicians are telling you, what your providers are telling you, what you read on the internet, there's always some uh, guideline out there not to eat this during the course of cancer treatment, which can lead to a restrictive diet. Fear of eating, you know, um, fear that my diet is going to worsen my cancer, fear that whatever I eat is going to make me feel sick, um, fear of, you know, just um, anything, fear related to foods um, can certainly lead to eating less. And moving over to anthropometrics, so we already talked a little bit about the, about the weight loss, uh, body composition, where there is a change uh, of how much muscle we may have or the level of fat stores that we have. Sarcopenia is a term that's used when there's a loss of muscle mass. So all that can contribute to malnutrition and cancer. Nutrient losses, you know, inflammation itself can do that. Malabsorption, uh, certainly when one has altered bowel habits or, you know, um, having surgery, say, on their small intestine that impacts their ability to absorb the nutrition that they're eating or certainly any type of surgery on their pancreas, like, for example, due to pancreatic cancer, can certainly impact how our body digests and absorb the nutrients that we need. So one can, you know, potentially eat 2,000 calories, but I don't know if you're absorbing all that 2,000 calories. So again, malabsorption can certainly get in the way of being able to stay nourished. And then medications, you know, chemotherapy and radiation, they can certainly um, highly contribute to the cause of malnutrition because they're the reason why we may develop side effects or, you know, weight loss or inflammation along that way. So there's different causes of malnutrition and all of them need to be looked at to really in order to treat malnutrition. So what is the impact of malnutrition and cancer? So we already touched a little bit already, but one is that, you know, loss of muscle mass and subcutaneous fat. Certainly eating less and weight loss can lead to potential deficiencies in the diet between macronutrients, which refers to carbohydrates, proteins and fats, and micronutrients refers to vitamins as another example. Um, malnutrition um, automatically increases the risk for refeeding syndrome. And refeeding syndrome is a constellation of symptoms that happens after one is suddenly fed after not being able to eat for some time. And we see um, changes in their labs, especially with potassium and magnesium and phosphorus levels, and we want to go slowly with those individuals. Um, malnutrition can impact how our organs are functioning, especially with the heart and lungs. Uh, you know, our with poor wound healing, our body doesn't have the nutrients it needs to heal, so it's slow. Uh, certainly after surgery, there's a lot of research to indicate we're able to optimize the nutrition before surgery. It can certainly enhance outcomes after surgery and may lead to a shorter hospital stay as well. So again, it can delay that if one is entering surgery um, malnourished. And certainly when we say functional capacity and strength, um, a sense of weakness and more fatigue, you know, not being able to do that 30 minute walk that you used to, um, that is also a consequence of malnutrition. So with all of that can and lead to, as I mentioned earlier, more hospital uh, stays, a longer hospital stay as well, admissions, um, hospital costs and overall a quality, quality of life. So the next two slides are going to focus on the impact of starvation and inflammation on nutrition from a physiological perspective. So starvation without inflammation, you know, we're eating less. This is a common occurrence that happens when we're sleeping during the night. So when there's no food or fluid um, coming into our body for some time, then our glucose levels will drop. And this um, triggers certain hormones to be secreted. So for one, um, glucagon is a hormone produced by the pancreas as well as insulin. So insulin levels go down and glucagon 
levels go up to help raise that um, glucose levels. And then with that said, that triggers a cascade of events where glycogen, which is a stored carbohydrate, uh, it's stored in the liver and it's broken down to help raise that um, glucose level. And then once the glycogen um, stores are completely gone, then it leads to protein and fat breakdown um, in the liver to make glucose. And this is pulled from your muscle and from your adipose tissue to bring that in. And this is within 24 hours. Hours. And then over time, it will switch over to making ketone, which is made from fat for fuel. And this is after two days. And during the course of starvation, um, you know, our metabolism slows, our muscle is preserved for, to protect it, and we use fat as a primary fuel. And then, you know, like I said, this can happen as an example during the night. In the morning, we, we wake up and we replenish um, our body with nutrients from our morning meal. Now, with in inflammation, okay? So what inflammation does is that it triggers, um, you know, production of other hormones, cortisol, glucagon, growth hormone as examples. And these hormones trigger a cascade of events, which is quite different from the mode of starvation. So for one, um, these hormones will trigger protein breakdown in muscle, fat breakdown in adipose tissue, uh, protein and fat breakdown to make glucose, and then cytokine synthesis in liver. It's really cytokines is, a, is like an inflammatory marker. And overall, all these nutrients are breaking down to be used as fuel to meet that demand um, that's imposed on our metabolism during um, cancer. And it's just used to the body sees it as a threat. You know, we need to heal. We need to repair. So metabolism automatically increases to help provide nutrients to repair tissue. So because this this is what potential can happen um, uh, with cancer that, again, um, not being able to consume enough calories and protein to help meet this demand can lead to weight loss, um, loss of muscle mass, loss of subcutaneous fat, um, overall lead to um, malnutrition. So with the diagnosis of malnutrition, overall, as dietitians, we look at what characteristics are coming forward um, from our patients? Or have they lost weight? You know, are, again, um, are they eating less? And then is there inflammation present? And we tend to characterize this malnutrition based on um, the characteristics identified and as well as inflammation. And then really looking at, is it a starvation-related malnutrition or is it inflammation-related malnutrition? And then that's gonna help us determine our interventions as well as um, estimated calories and protein and fluid needs for this patient. So with that said, um, I talked a little bit about uh, the background of malnutrition. I'm gonna turn it over to Astrid to talk about um, ongoing interventions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Neha. Um, so my name is Astrid Shapiro. I'm an oncology dietitian, um, and we work in the same department, um, working um, with patients um, that are going through some uh, stage of the cancer care process. Maybe they've just been diagnosed, and um, they want to, you know, get. Uh, their nutrition up um, before they have their surgery and in, 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 in uh, therapy. Um, and then also, um, you know, managing side effects, which I'm going to talk a little bit about here. Um, and then also we do some work in survivorship um, after treatment, then what? So, um, so um, Nea did a wonderful job at explaining, you know, what's really happening in the body, what's different in the body during cancer and during cancer treatment that will change sort of uh, the nutrition goals um, to help um, prevent or resolve malnutrition. So um, in terms of, you know, the patient's experience, um, there's a lot of different factors that can in, in, um, impact um, why they're getting less food and less fluids. And one of the most common um, side effects or, or uh, you know, results that a patient may experience, maybe even just by getting a cancer diagnosis and knowing I have cancer, is that the appetite can go way down, just not interested in food, feeling really stressed. Often a lot of the um, treatment drugs can also cause a decreased appetite. 
people also often find that the natural hunger cues like that you get when you wake up in the morning to have breakfast or lunchtime or dinner are just not there for a number of reasons. And so that can make it very challenging to stay in a routine of getting adequate nutrition at the frequency and at the, the concentration that's needed. Um, the second item, symptoms. So symptoms that can develop from the disease itself. Um, maybe we've got a tumor in our intestine that's causing a blockage. And so every time we try to eat, we get really nauseous because we can't pass any solid foods. Um, we can also get um, you know, early fullness. Um, a lot of patients, especially ones that don't have a very good appetite, will say, well, you know, I finally got around to eating something, but I could only handle a couple bites and I just felt really full. Um, so that's also very common. Fatigue is very common um, from just stress and from, you know, like maybe if somebody's getting radiation, it can be very uh, exhausting and dehydrating. Um, nausea, vomiting from the chemotherapies at times. Um, Neha had mentioned uh, taste changes. Um, one of the more common side effects of certain chemotherapies and also when one is getting radiation to the head or neck area, it can distort the cells that help to produce our, our taste buds, which are very sophisticated, and it can really tweak and, and kind of throw a monkey wrench in that signal transduction that comes from the, the tongue to the brain, which tells us uh, what flavor that is. Um, also, altered bowel habits. Maybe somebody's getting diarrhea, they're getting dehydrated. Um, constipation can be common. Constipation actually contributes to lowering appetite often, and it can also um, potentiate nausea as well. So oftentimes when we're working with a patient, we're treating one symptom to help resolve multiple symptoms. Um, dehydration can be a really big one, um, just not just not having that thirst uh, cue there. Um, some patients develop uh, an aversion to the flavor of water, and so they just don't drink enough fluids. Um, dehydration can also um, uh, cause or um, uh, worsen uh, constipation and also fatigue as well. Um, maybe we don't. Maybe there's not a good support system at home. The patient's tired, and they think that they have to cook all of their meals from scratch, and um, they're just getting worn out. Um, they don't have anybody to help them, you know, get access to foods and stuff like that. So logistics can also be a barrier. Emotional stress, well-being, those are absolutely really, really important things to address. So like, are we addressing depression? Are we helping to manage stress? Um, are we also having discussions with the patients and the caretaker about what sort of the changed eating experience is like for the patient? Patients will come in and say, you know, I meet, I'm at the dinner table with my family and they're eating all this food and I just, it's food that I love and I just, I just can't imagine eating it. It just looks so disgusting to me. And people can really develop a feeling of like, almost like alienation, like I'm experiencing this really weird it, I'm having this experience that's making me feel really um, um, separated from other people. So oftentimes when in the counseling, um, we, we will talk about how's, how's it feeling for you? What's coming up for you? What conversations can we have that can help normalize these feelings? And also get the caretakers to kind of understand where the patient's coming from and vice versa. And it really helps promote compassion and, um, and sort of more, you know, better communication, more supportive environment. Um, lack of physical activity, we're tired, so I'm just not gonna go for my walk. However, we know that even with any patient, like a hospitalized patient that's recovering from a surgery or, or an illness, we wanna get them out of bed and go for a little walk every day. It really does take the edge off of the fatigue. It helps promote circulation in the body to get those nutrients to the cells that we wanna um, nourish. Um, also helps ox ox see if I can say this correctly, um, oxygenate. Um, the tissues, which is really important, and also bring wastes away. So one of the other things um, that can happen too is poor medication management. So oftentimes people going through treatment are gonna have to be taking lots of medications 
um, supportive medications, like to help with the nausea, to help with the constipation. And sometimes, you know, patients will, you know, just not want to take another pill. And they're like, well, I'm kind of nauseated. And, you know, I, I'd rather just not take the pill. So, and, and we understand and respect that. But what we really hope that the patient can understand is sort of looking at, well, is this symptom to the point that it's impairing my ability to meet my nutrition goals? And then maybe reconsider. Um, sometimes just uh, doing a trial of taking the medication um, uh, scheduled, so several times a day as, as prescribed for a few days, can, can also help somebody who's been resistant to taking the medications figure out for themselves by doing that short experiment whether or not this is something that will really improve. Um, so that that's um, pretty important. Um, so in, in terms of the actual interventions for addressing malnutrition, um, there's different um, modalities. Um, of course, first of all, looking at, you know, the food and the nutri nutrient delivery aspects. Um, let's see, where am I here? Oh. Um, you know, obviously looking at your meals, your size of the meals, um, how many you're having a day, um, looking at adjusting calories, maybe, maybe Bob is like not eating very much at the beginning of the day and he's trying to load on, up all his calories at the end of the day so that within a 24 hour period he's still not meeting his needs. So really making sure that we're spreading the calories and the protein throughout the day. We may need to increase or decrease certain nutrients in the diet. Like maybe somebody's not getting enough protein, or maybe they're getting, they're eating really high fiber, which is kind of uh, less opportunity to get more calorie rich or protein rich foods in. So we can we can look at that. Um, also, again, you know, improving access to foods or the eating environment, um, making sure that they have foods foods at home. Sorry, <laughs> wasn't close enough. Um, and that, um, you know, maybe um, having some frozen meals or some canned um, um, foods available on those days when, you know, what's been prepared for dinner just isn't appetizing enough or maybe we're nauseated and the smell of it is just not working. So we have things to lean on. Um, I did also want to say that um, in looking at food and nutrient delivery and thinking about the food environment, um, the way the food is presented, for example, um, presenting for somebody who has a very poor appetite and gets full fast, presenting them a dish on a regular size plate can be kind of intimidating because it looks like a lot of food. If you take that same food and you put it on a smaller plate or put it in a smaller cup and present it to them, they, they tend to have more confidence, like, okay, it doesn't look like so much. So there are certain strategies um, about just the behaviors of the way we eat and how we eat and how we present it that can also be helpful. Uh, okay, and then um, nutrition education and counseling, and that's really where the dietitians come in. So usually when we meet a patient for the first time, the very first thing we want to know is, let's talk about your current dietary pattern. And so from there, we can really work with and individualize the 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 recommended dietary plan based on where the patient is already operating from. And ideally, that's more realistic. I mean, somebody's going through treatment. There's a lot of new things in the life. There's a lot of things that are changing. And ideally, it would be nice to keep some things like the intimacy of how we eat uh, as normal as possible. So what we do is we do a diet recall, and then we think about what are the nutrition goals, and then we... Um, help to develop and apply strategies that are patient specific. Um, we also educate like what is the recommended nutrition pattern during treatment for, for you and the outcomes we're looking for. Um, this also is a very important place in which we can, uh, we can um, get a little more information about what the patient's knowledge base is and what their belief systems are about the food we're eating. Neha also did talk about how people can um, develop a lot of fear about what to eat, worried that it's going to worsen their cancer or um, that, um, 
you know, they may have heard about a special anti-cancer diet, which is a very restrictive diet. And oftentimes what we will see is that many people are over-restricting their diet unnecessarily. And so really what we want to do is diversify the diet as much as possible. So that's really where, where our, our um, focus is there. Um, coordination of care is really important. Sometimes there are other things going on with the patient that are not directly nutrition related, but impact nutrition. For example, somebody who has um, uh, head and neck cancer, they might have a tumor in an area that's making chewing and swallowing really difficult. They may have like a really dry mouth from treatment, which makes eating the normal foods that they like, like chips or toast really difficult. And so they just say, I'm just not going to eat that. But then they don't replace it with something. So um, what can be really helpful is to send them to the speech therapist who can sort of, uh, who can do a, a swallow study on them and make recommendations on what are the optimal um, uh, textures that are safe. Also with swallowing, some people will develop a lot of coughing and choking, um, which I forgot to mention. And that's again, where the swallow study can be really helpful. Also, um, if somebody you know, maybe wants to increase their physical activity and they're not really sure what's safe to do. We actually do have um, free exercise consultations that we can um, uh, kind of connect you with to do, to do that through the supportive care program. Lots of resources there, so we work with them quite often. All right. So some of the specific strategies, and these are concepts that we use to help um, improve intake, are first just being, you know, appreciating why we need the nutrition and how much we need, and then really planning and preparing to eat on a schedule, not based on hunger, and usually um, trying to, to, to uh, replenish uh, calories and protein at least every three hours, I like to say every two to three hours, so that we're eating um like it says underneath that, um, small, more frequent meals. And this, this does really help manage some of the side effects of like early, when, when you get full fast called early satiety, eating smaller meals is going to make it more likely you're going to be able to finish the meal and that you're not going to be so full by the time you have your next meal that you're not going to be able to even think about eating something. Um, Prior, prior, so when you're building your plate, like when you're choosing what to eat, you really want to prioritize consumption of high quality proteins and energy dense foods. So foods that are going to give you calories um, for those those energy demand that energy demand. So the, the most energy quality in terms of concentration comes from carbohydrate rich foods and and fat. Whereas we want the protein to be preserved for uh, repair and um, preserving muscle mass. And uh, in the next slide, we'll look at some examples, like a sample list of uh, protein and um, calorie content of various foods. Um, if we're having a lot of symptoms like um, sore throat, diarrhea, something like that, or we're getting full fast and we just, we just can't get a lot of volume in, we may want to do things like consider limiting high fiber foods because we think about you think about fiber, fiber is, it's, it's a very um, sort of like, it, it, it has a lot of bulk in it, but it that takes up real estate in our stomach and in our intestines that doesn't offer calories and protein. So, um, you know, some of the more high fiber foods would be like non-starchy vegetables, like broccoli, cauliflower, all the, you know, Brussels sprouts, all the, you know, kale, all the really healthy foods we're supposed to be eating. Um, it's great to be able to eat those when we can, but when it's, when that fiber load is getting in the way of us, you know, we're still losing weight, then we may want to reconsider adjusting that for the time being. So these are really, uh, just sort of, reprioritizing for the short, short term and then long term when our digestive systems have recovered, when we're eating well, we can start massaging these foods back into our diet. Um, we also may want to consider limiting digestive irritants like fried foods, spicy foods, caffeine, or alcohol if, if, if we're having nausea or, you know, um, maybe reflux or just abdominal pain with meals. So a lot of it is about 
really paying attention to what the body's telling you. And then we talk about it and we can help you make some decisions around there. And then also um, optimizing what I call food acceptability. So with the taste changes and the poor appetite, we may not be hungry. We may be interested in eating. Um, the food that we're eating may not taste in, like, like we expect it to. And all those things can can decrease our interest and our, our desire to eat. So we want to, you know, adjust things when and where we can. So texture, if hard food is difficult to chew, then let's, let's do soft food. So instead of chips, let's do maybe some a soft cooked rice or something like that. So maybe substituting uh, the nutritional value of one food for another that, that fits more of the needs and is easier. Um, adjusting temperature of food can be very effective, especially if we're nauseated. Hot foods tend to be more exacerbating, whereas cold or, or um, room temperature foods tend to be a little little easier. Plus, foods that are room temperature or cold don't have that strong aroma that some um, uh, more aromatic foods like chicken soup or something like that can have if we're feeling nauseated. Um, we can also work with um, flavor. Um, sometimes um, eating more bland foods um, can can help manage nausea better than eating foods that have really strong flavors or vice versa. And this tends to be a very subjective um, uh, experience for patients. And so we really just have to kind of check and it can change over the course of the treatment. Um, so what I want to do here is just take a minute. Um, I want to just give you guys an opportunity to just kind of check out this slide. So this is a sam sample list of um, calorie and protein content of various foods. So I just want you to look at it, kind of consider, you know, what we just talked about, about, you know, really focusing on calorie dense and protein dense foods and, and focusing and prioritizing that. And I wanted you to just t let me know if you, any observations that you may notice, just can yell it out. <laughs> Even the dietitians. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. There you go. That would be helpful. Fats. What's that? Yeah, what about the fats? I see lots of healthy fats. Lots of healthy fats, okay. Lots of plant-based fats, yeah. So um, I'll show you my observation. So my observations, so I'm looking at the top left corner. We're looking at, okay, we see some, some lean animal proteins, um, beef, turkey, salmon, chicken. Um, we see an egg. Um, and then we also see some dairy products. Um, and then we look over at the calorie. Um, and they seem, you know, on this list to, to have a, carry a pretty good amount of calories. Um, and then looking over at the protein, they seem to be sort of in the higher range of protein provision. Um, we go down to uh, beans, um, which is a really great plant-based um, protein. Not everybody eats animal protein. Um, but animal protein and dairy protein tend to be very high quality proteins in terms of um, uh, them having all the essential amino acids that the body needs to make its own proteins. Um, plant proteins are great, but a lot of times a single plant um, will be deficient in one or two essential amino acids. The other thing with plant-based proteins is the foods that they come in tend to be very high fiber. And so if you're really trying to push and maximize protein, it may be harder to get there if we're pushing just plant proteins and getting really full on fiber at the same time. So we, we need to kind of weigh, weigh those pros and cons. Um, and then uh, we see peanut butter, almond butter, that is very high in, in, in calories, mainly from the fat that was mentioned here. And then it has a pretty good um, source of protein in it. Um, we go down to soy milk, which um, can be almost is about about the same calorie range and can be almost have almost as much protein as regular milk, which is good. The next item I put on there, it's um, one cup of almond rice or coconut milk. So certain pe certain t certain times, um, people will maybe not tolerate dairy, or I don't drink dairy, or I don't drink soy, and so they do um, non-dairy substitutes. 
Um, and these are okay. However, if you compare the calorie density and the protein density, um, I tell people that these are kind of more akin to the nutrition in water versus what you would get from drinking a glass of milk or a glass of soy milk from a calorie and protein standpoint. So with these, if you're somebody who has to stick to these, what I would recommend is fortifying it with maybe a protein powder or something like that to bring the protein up. So you're still getting, you're not missing an opportunity to get protein from this, this fluid. Um, and then um, we see, you know, starchy foods like rice, noodles, pastas, oatmeal, and also much lower down on the list, uh, mashed potatoes tend to be pretty high in calories, moderate in protein. Um, we've got an avocado, which is a really good calorie source. There's really no protein, but it's a great calorie source. It's a, it's a very versatile food that you can put in you know, um, soups, you can put it in casseroles, you can put it in a fruit salad to bring the calories up. Um, the two at the bottom, um, cooked vegetables, so those non-starchy vegetables that are high in fiber, low in calories, low in protein, and then your leafy greens are going to be extremely low in calories and protein. So you want to negotiate, you know, is this what I want to be loading up on? Like, do I want to have a half of my plate a salad and then a chicken breast and potatoes or do I want to do more of the chicken breast and potatoes and then maybe eat a little bit of the salad later after I've made sure that I've focused on the calorie dense foods so it's really just um, being strategic about how we build our plate um, I also just wanted to point out that um, a lot of fruit, like watermelon, for example, um, can also be very low in calories. A cup of watermelon would be 45 calories and less than one gram of protein. So I have a lot of patients that like to, like to eat fruit as a snack. But when we compare, you know, maybe having half of an avocado with a cup of watermelon, there's a huge uh, disparity between the calories and the protein. So I would say, you know, enjoy your watermelon, but have smaller amounts of it and pair it with something that has higher calories and protein. So there you go. This is a fun little algorithm that was created by a woman named Rebecca Katz. Um, she's a wonderful lady who lives here in the Bay Area, and she's a chef. And she's um, devoted a lot of her profession to um, creating recipes and um, meal plans for patients going through treatment. And um, the ingredients that she uses are very um, evidence-based in terms of anti-inflammatory and whatnot. We have a lot of her cookbooks here if you want to check them out. But this is um, a schematic that she came up to help um, manage taste changes. So, for example, if something over on the left side is too sweet, you can just kind of follow the line. Um, you would add something acidic to that to kind of push down the sweetness. Or maybe you could add something salty to, put, put, to kind of counterbalance the sweetness. Or if something over here on the all the the, the, the right side was too bitter, you can maybe add something sweet like maple syrup. So it's really sort of being the, the, the chemist there, the flavor chemist to kind of modulate um, uh, flavors. So this is, this is a concept really. So instead of salt, you could use soy sauce or teriyaki sauce or something or like Bragg's amino acids or whatever. But it's just, um, just sort of kind of a fun thing to play with. Um, so I've been talking a little bit about, you know, focusing on calorie and protein density of your meal. So the idea is when you're building your plate, you want to increase your calorie and protein density without significantly increasing the total volume of food. And that was my example with the watermelon. So instead of a cup of watermelon, maybe do half a cup and then throw some slices of avocado in there or something similar that has uh, calories. Um, one of the things that you can do um, to sort of push protein in foods is you can use protein-rich fluids or powders. 
um, in your food. So for example, um, I encourage a lot of people to try using milk or, or soy milk instead of water when they're, they're preparing their cooked cereals or even rice or even noodles. And some people go, yuck. And other people go, oh, I'm going to try that tonight. So that can be a way to really help infuse protein into the grain um, and also electrolytes. Um, and you can use lactose-free milk if possible. Um, again, if you're using uh, a dairy alternative milk like almond, coconut, or rice, you I would say um, encourage you to protein fortify that fluid before you use it as a protein-rich fluid. Um, I like um, unflavored whey protein powder because it's very versatile in terms of its flavor. You can use it in sweet. Like you can put it in a soup or you can put it in a smoothie. Um, or if you don't want to do a dairy-based protein, um, do a mixed vegetable protein source. So again, vegetables um, or produce or plant-based foods tend to be limiting in amino acids, certain amino acids. So you would want it to be a mixed source so that you make sure that you get uh, more likely to get those amino acids. Um, also using more plant-based fat sources, so like using nut butters, like stirring nut butter, peanut butter into your oatmeal or into your smoothie, um, using avocados in a similar way, um, enhancing calories by adding vegetable oils, like you know putting a little bit of olive oil over your rice or even putting it in your smoothie or in your soup can help really massage some calories in there. Um, another way, we've kind of talked about this a little bit, is really take advantage of getting calories and protein through the fluids you're consuming. You're going to be encouraged to drink a lot of water, and you need that to, you know, um, uh, to um, sort of flush out the organs and, and whatnot um, and keep you hydrated. But remember that there's a lot of water in, in many different fluids already. So milk, for example, Eight ounces of milk can give you about 150 calories and 10 grams of protein versus a cup of water that'll give you zero. Um, soy milk also um, is, is a good source. Also drinking broths and soups, um, in part also for just the electrolytes um, that you can get. Um, oral rehydration solutions, um, which is sort of a global term, and that would inc include beverages like Gatorade and Pedialyte. Um, and there's some other ones that come in a powder form that you mix in, in water or you can do it in juice or whatnot. Um, eating jello and popsicles. So any food that's going to be fluid at body temperature counts towards that um, fluid intake. Um, and of course, shakes and smoothies, either homemade or, or ready to drink like Orgain or Ensure. So um, lastly, I just kind of want to sum up by this, this section by just really encouraging to keep things simple. There's a lot of things going on. And again, you know, some people think that I, you know, to maximize nu my nutrition, I have to cook everything from scratch every day, every meal. It does not have to be that way. You really want to lean on, you know, planning and preparing things like freezing portions of cooked meals for later. Um, uh, leaning on some, you know, ready to eat fresh prepared or packaged foods, uh, really allowing others to help. Some people don't want help. But interestingly, uh, I learned this from one of our social workers that when there are people that want to help, it's because they feel stressed and they want to feel like they're doing something. And when you allow them to help, it really helps relieve some of the stress they're experiencing. So it's kind of like a gift you're giving to them, which I thought was cool. Um, you can also, you know, to, to help remind yourself, okay, I got to eat every three hours or I got to try something or be open to trying something every three hours. You can set alarms. Um, you can, you can just write out a me meal schedule and do some pre-planning on what you might want to eat and when you may want to eat it. Um, and then last, you know, including those homemade or ready to drink high calorie, high protein liquid nutrition beverages sometimes can be you know, just, just the silver bullet in terms of like, okay, I just need that extra couple hundred calories a day. And if I just drink this smoothie once or twice a day as a snack, then that'll cover me. And, and drinking calories and protein is great because you're not only giving yourself calories and energy molecules and protein, but you're also hydrating yourself at the same time. So that's, um, really helpful. And there's a wide variety of options available, conventional for, 
you know, just your average Joe. There's also organic formulations, allergen-free formulations. There's plant-based, there's vegan. There's also one um, to manage, you know, high blood sugars or, you know, malabsorption, stuff like that. So come to your dietitian and, and ask us. So that was a lot of information. I hope not too much. Um, we want to try to apply that now. So we're going to do a little exercise, which Erica's going to lead, and then she's going to take us home. Thank you. Oh, here's my water. <laughs> All right. Hello, my name is Erica Connor, um, and uh, I, I've been at the Palo Alto Center for many years, and now I'm at the South Bay uh, Center since it's open. So um, I've uh, done this for many, many, many years. Uh, so as far as our little exercise now um, is, here we have just a plain bowl of oatmeal, or it could be any hot cereal that you like. Let's just say that. Uh, what types of things, um, with Astrid's fabulous review of um, boosting calories, of what types of things do you guys think that, what would you do with this oatmeal? If, again, you're, you, you're, you're looking at this, it's morning, or it could be, it could be evening. Uh, you're looking at this going, I got to get this in, and I got to make this wor worth my while. So, what do you, um, oops, gosh, I, thank you. Um, what types of things would you guys do to this oh, bowl of oatmeal? I always have oatmeal every morning, and so I always add blueberries or raspberries, dash of honey, Great. and milk. So okay, blueberries, milk. raspberries, dash of honey, milk. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm using that um, uh, oak milk. No, oak. The oat milk? Okay, yeah. So again, adding those things, or what I'm looking at is calories, 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 calories. Wonderful. Uh, any other suggestions that anybody else has? Butter. Anything? You could add butter. You could add, so a couple things that you, again, to kind of review, looking back at the previous slides and things like that, is first thing you could do is you could say, how do I make my oatmeal? Do I make it with water? Could I make it with you know, a different liquid as far as um, a milk or a milk alternative? So just by doing that, oftentimes you're increasing by 100 calories approximately, just right off the bat. The other thing too is just what additions could you add? If you're adding anything from butter to, some people will add oil, um, a couple you know, tablespoons of avocado, things like that, a um, couple tablespoons, either one or two tablespoons of uh, a nut butter, also stirring that in. Um, I mean, many, many different things. So basically, all of those things is literally approximately 100 calories, 100 calories, 100 calories. So we've gone from 160 calories of just oatmeal with water to sometimes close to 500 calories, depending on the concoction we kind of create. Uh, so lots of different options, uh, including uh, anything from fruits to, again, those healthy fats. Um, and I know it sounds weird to think, you know, why would I add avocado to my oatmeal? It's actually very interesting uh, to do, and depending on, again, what's going on. If you, you know, if that mentally is a roadblock, then okay, we need to consider something else. But for a lot of people who already have dull tastes um, or, you know, again, taste challenges, and they can't even taste it, some people are willing, I'll add that avocado in because... I can't taste anything anyway, it's gonna be, I'm gonna be fine with it. So it also kind of depends too on where the mind's at. Uh, so uh, we, we have a lot of creative additions for sure. So the next step, so when oral diet is not enough, what do we do? Um, number one, we review and optimize medication management of symptoms. So we, you know, as a team collaboratively, we will say, what, what are the issues at hand? Is it pain? Are we taking pain medication? And if we are, are we constipated? Mm -hmm. So again, where, where's this loss of appetite um, you know, and eating challenges coming from? Uh, nausea, same thing. Are we taking the medication or are we trying not to take the medication? And where is that? where are these obstacles? Gas, digestive issues, again, what, what's the problem at hand? And more importantly, what are we going to do about it to fix the problem? 
Uh, we could consider appetite stimulants. So that's certainly an option. There are many out there that are just appetite stimulants. There are many that will help with sleep. And a side effect is increased appetite. So it really depends on, um, again, everybody's individual situation at hand and what the best fit is for that person. Uh, consider um, enteral nutrition, which is uh, nutrition through a feeding tube, or parenteral nutrition feeding through a, an IV. So again, we work with the team and you, know, you as a patient. What is the issue at hand? And if we need to get fuel in, if it can't go through the mouth, how, what are our best, next best, best options um, to really try to minimize and certainly avoid malnutrition? Uh, some uh, indications for enteral nutrition, so again, for uh, tube, tube feeding. This involves, uh, again, delivery through a feeding tube um, and through typically specialized uh, formulas. Some indications would be a functional or, uh, or partially function, functional GI tract, because um, we certainly, we want to use the gut um, as much as possible. Uh, in, inadequate calorie intake or intolerance to diet and not, or not safe for oral intake. So that could be uh, head and neck population, inability to swallow, unsafe to swallow. So the last thing we want is aspiration and then dealing with pneumonia. Uh, it, this could be tumor burden, uh, as far as maybe a, a tumor in the esophagus, not able to pass food down. Um, you know, many, many different, different um, issues at hand. Um, or have had uh, weight loss that has progressed. So some people might be eating. They're so challenged with side effects, uh, many, all the ones that we previously talked about, uh, just not able to meet the needs. And so uh, some people may have a feeding tube and feed at night, um, and then they eat during the day. So it all depends. Again, very individualized um, uh, adventure, um, where also we play a very important piece of that because we work with the entire team as well as with the, whichever um, um, selective company who's providing that service for you. So we work actually uh, very closely with, um, with those, that supportive team. Some indications for parenteral nutrition, so um, feeding through an IV, uh, again, not able to tolerate um, any tube feeding or enteral nutrition, not able to get, um, or maybe not even to, able to get the feeding tube placed. So that could be um, kind of, again, tumor burden. It could be anatomy. Um, there could be a lot of um, different complications with that. Malabsorption of nutrients causing weight loss. So that's a big one. So where we would actually bypass the gut and, uh, and just, again, say, OK, GI tract, you rest. We're going to um, you know, get you some nutrition through, through your veins, through the IV. Um, complete obstruction of the intestine. That's possible too. So again, if we can't feed um, through the GI tract, we'll go another route for sure. <clears throat> um, or the paralysis of the GI tract, same thing. The GI tract is not working, whether it needs, it's not working at the time, it's resting, uh, and so we just go uh, another route. Most important thing is we have, you need the calories, you need the protein, you need all those macro and micronutrients, um, so we just go with the next, you know, a, another option. Again, uh, the dietitian is a very important piece to that puzzle as well. Um, engage in physical activity. And sometimes, I, again, as we talk uh, to patients about this, sometimes I'll get the eye roll of, um, oh, you know, I'm just so tired, I, I can't think about it. Um, and there are, you know, as far as studies with regard to um, muscle loss and, and uh, and that big challenge, you know, again, studies are kind of not all over the place, but nothing really, um, you know, definite of, oh, you have to do this or you have to, you know, this particular exercise for this exact time. Um, so again, well, <laughs> this thing is just very timid. Um, so we just want you to move, super, super important. Uh, so. A general kind of guideline is 150 minutes, which again, kind of people go, whoa. Um, 
but that's during a, during the week. Uh, so again, you can kind of decide, okay, this is a better day. I can do this amount to this day. I can do this amount this day. Uh, and even within the day, sometimes it's five minutes here and it could be 10 minutes, you know, another at another time. Um, muscle strengthening too. I really, um, it, that could be just as simple as using just your own body weight and strength um, to sometimes picking up something in the kitchen and doing that to even weights. Again, the supportive care uh, program is a very, very important piece to that. Um, the exercise program, I cannot say enough um, great things about it. Um, there are many, many realistic, realistic, that's the key factor, realistic exercises that you can do at home. Um, even if you're sitting in a chair and you're just lifting up your legs, you realize, oh, oh my gosh, I have a muscle there, <laughs> you know, um, and I can feel it working. So even if it's doing that five, 10 times a day, um, it's so much better than nothing. So super, super important. Um, and if you are feeling good, then go for it. Then go for that walk, go, go you know, do those extra exercises. Um, you know, we don't want you to overdo it, but um, that's the other piece is, with regard to the um, exercise consultations, they can help you come up with a plan, a realistic plan that can really uh, help you, you know, again, get through the day and certainly get through treatment and um, to, as far as a faster, and heal, a faster healing process as well. Um, so again, uh, you already know the kind of the role of the dietitian because we've said it um, so many times. Just to be there again as a support to uh, specifically cover the nutrition aspect and hopefully, like we mentioned, avoid if not slow down and stop the malnutrition uh, you know, issue at hand. Uh, to certainly develop a personalized plan um, at home and to help reduce side effects. Again, working out what exactly is the problem at hand and what can we do to minimize possibly, or even make it go away so we can eat and drink uh, appropriately. And uh, certainly give ongoing support, um, super important. Uh, you know, we're, we're just happy to help as, as much as we can. Um, with regard to just patients, uh, you know, sometimes forgetting to eat. You know, I have somebody today I called uh, about one o'clock and he picked up the phone and I said, did you eat lunch today? Oh, it's you. Um, uh, well, <laughs> you know, um, he was hanging up the phone and making lunch. So thankfully, uh, so it, it's just one of those things where, it, you know, it's trying to put these tactics into place to make it work. Uh, so we certainly want to be a part of it. The one important thing I wanted to mention too uh, is the difference. There is one between starvation which is really kind of the, the base of uh, the big component to malnutrition, uh, and fasting. So um, fasting is different. There's a, there's, the big difference is fasting is intentional. Starvation is unintentional. We're not trying to do this to ourselves. Um, the other piece is that fasting, there's so many different really kind of models of fasting. Um, it could be anything from, uh, first of all, uh, what they call a wet fasting, which is um, you, you're allowed water or non-caloric beverages like tea, um, or dry fasting where it's no food, no liquid, um, or there's, uh, again, just certain foods that you need to avoid. Um, and usually it's large groups of the foods, um, and really that's completely, you know, very, very restrictive. Um, the other piece of fasting is the time period. So it could be anything from a few hours, anything from eight hours to 13 hours, um, up to 24 hours and beyond. So anything from one day, two days, all those. Um, studies are underway to help us understand more of where the fasting fits in. The key component is that with fasting, if somebody is already challenged with eating, whether it's side effect, you know, uh, like side effect management is just not really there. So you're nauseous, um, you have taste changes, uh, you're, you know, you're having diarrhea. Um, 
that is one piece that is really important that maybe f fasting, you're already in trouble and we gotta look at how appropriate fasting would be for you. Uh, the other thing is if you've already started to lose weight and your weight, you're considered kind of an underweight with the body mass index really, we kind of, we don't want anybody fasting, you know, with a body mass index less than 20. Um, so there are some parameters where it's just not really appropriate and it could be actually scary for patients. Um, it's interesting, we see this all the time. And again, we're advocates, we wanna get people through treatment, treatment. we want it to be successful. Um, but I have seen, uh, like I saw, I had two patients, um, both women going through same treatment. One was trying out the fasting, fasting for you know 13 hours, things like that. Um, she was doing okay. Um, she's a little fatigued, a little more than maybe necessary. Um, another lady was it was terrible. She, it was exacerbating her nausea. She right, it was it just didn't work. So again, it's a concept that has to you have to ask: Is this for me? Is this is this going to work for me? Um, really, really important. And that's again where we can help as far as you know, making sure things aren't too restrictive. Um, and again, just the overall goal of better outcomes, strength, quality of life, all that. Uh, and f as far as the summary, um, talked about inflammation uh, from cancer increases risk of malnutrition. Uh, the malnutrition can lead to uh, longer length of stay in the hospital for sure, multiple um, hospital admissions, increased risk of mortality and morbidity, uh, and decreased quality of life. So we just want to really try to avoid that. Uh, assessing uh, for moderate or severe malnutrition involves evaluating uh, for weight changes, decreased food fluid intake, uh, loss of muscle uh, and, and fat mass. And that's one of the things I think that is the most um, prominent for somebody, especially a caregiver who is caring for somebody who's going through treatment, is they actually will see the muscle and fat loss. Um, uh, or certainly if they you know, put their hand on their loved one and it's like you put their, your hand on your, their arm and it's like, oh, that arm's a lot smaller than it used to be. Um, so again, just those real key components that, that we unfortunately look for in malnutrition. Um, and then as far as interventions that may include um, addressing symptoms first and foremost, for sure, um, from the cancer treatment, and then um, certainly just being as creative as we can at adding extra calories uh, and increasing physical activity. So everything being realistic and within reason for that particular person. And references if you're interested. Um, so thank you so much, and uh, if any questions, we're happy to address those. anything else specific as far as because when I first got this um, I was reading that sugar is so bad for cancer sugar um, cancer just devours sugar so I cut sugar out of my diet all the time so um, whether that was a good thing or a bad thing I don't know but um, there's nothing in this saying well if I were you I would avoid sugar and, and things like that so is there sort of lists of food that you would say well but, uh, and then like broccoli is supposed to be brilliant, but you have to eat 600 pounds of broccoli to make any difference. So, <laughs> right. you, know, so you have to kind of weigh it all up. <laughs> right. So uh, again, the question uh, is that we didn't address sugar um, because again, sugar is not necessarily, there's not a malnutrition. Uh, I mean, it, there can be. When we talked in the very beginning when, when Neha brought o up the overnutrition, um, so a little tidbit on that is that overnutrition leading to malnutrition is a good example of that is somebody eating a diet, a lot of highly processed foods, a lot of added sugars, um, where again, they're getting all these calories, but very little nutrients, micro and macro nutrients, very little protein. Um, that's a good example where somebody actually could still lose muscle for sure in that situation. From the sugar perspective, um, again, it's not you know really part necessarily of, of the malnutrition piece. However, just to address it is a suggestion is to really to look at any added sugar. So it's not saying oh I can't have that fruit, or it's not saying you know oh no grains for me. 
that's not what it's about. It's about looking for the balance, making sure again, like, um, like Astrid had mentioned, looking at like your plate and do you have a protein source? Do you have a, a grain, a carbohydrate source? Where are your vegetables coming from? Looking at that balance piece. Um, it's incredible, sad, there's a lot of different adjectives you can use. Um, at looking at some of our, our food products out there and the amount of added sugar in things, um, not only added sugars, but also sugar substitutes of what it's doing to our taste buds as far as to kind of make us want more. Um, so again, it's looking at balance and you know where, where are my added sugars coming from? It's not about, oh, I can't have any honey or anything in my tea you know, or anything like that. It's, gosh, how much do I put in? So um, what I find with regard to like say hot beverages is I find that you, people get in a habit. You know, they, they get their coffee, they get their tea, uh, and this is just like being at a you know, coffee place or whatever. They go to the counter, you know, the other counter, and then they just set their cup down and they grab some packets and they rip them open and pour them in. And I wanna so badly go by and say, when was the last time you kind of ripped maybe one open, did a little, stirred it, and then tasted it? My, my challenge with looking at added sugar is how low can you go? How low can you go to get your taste buds to say, nah, I'm good, this is enough, okay? So again, just some strategies with regard to, you know, trying to minimize kind of the added sugars, so. Any, do you guys have anything to add to that? Okay. Yeah. Uh, my question is about use of uh, probiotics after somebody been given lots of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. I have a friend right now who's in the Stanford Hospital. <coughs> She's been there for several weeks. Uh, she was uh, uh, t she was doing chemo, and then she unfortunately got a rare form of uh, fungal meningitis infection. So she's been given lots of antibiotics for the last several weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, after she goes through that treatment, should she consider using probiotics to restore her it it will actually depend on many factors as far as kind of where her medical status is at that point do you, do you guys want to weigh in on that question anybody no um i mean feel free to add to it i'll i can start um because uh, number one thing is where kind of her immune system in uh, where her immune system is where her blood counts are if um one concern we have is if your, your, if immune system is compromised, we, it's, it's a little iffy as if we want to blast the system with probiotics and what kind of probiotic. So that's the, the key factor. Um, many people just, again, off the street, um, just every day, um, you know, no, nobody who's getting discharged from a hospital. Um, when you go to the pharmacy and you get an antibiotic, very common, it is common for a pharmacist to say, hey, and I suggest getting this probiotic while you're taking you know, the antibiotic to help your digestive system. That's, that is not uncommon. Um, but again, it's exactly where the probiotic fits in, especially somebody really getting a high dose of an antibiotic for a long period of time, of where that fits in for that person. Yeah. Do you want to add anything to it? Okay. I think that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you.